Father's Day is a fun day. Uh, my wife asked me, she's like, what do you want to eat for Father's Day? And that really kind of sums up the whole day, doesn't it? I mean, that's how you celebrate dad. <laughs> it's not what do you want to do, where do you want to go? The question, if all the dads are honest in the room today, is what do you want to eat? And usually that's a pretty easy question, but on Father's Day, often that turns into me going and having to grill something because what I like to eat is on the grill. And so on the day, my day, I end up working for everyone else. And so I was like, we're going out to eat. That's what we're doing uh, today. And so, uh, but I don't know what your plans are, but I'm glad you may be my part of your plans today. Uh, if I've not got a chance to meet you, my name is John, and my wife and I get the privilege of pastoring this church. And today, uh, for the first time in a couple weeks, I get to bring the word. Uh, a couple weeks ago, our team, uh, we took our first ever missions trip to Peru, and uh, I did not lack uh, opportunities to preach there. I think we did uh, in seven days, I think if, I'm, if I remember right, ask some of our people, I think we did nine church services. Um, and so I got plenty of preaching in and I was glad to have team teach Sunday last week and so grateful for them and, and just hearing from people from our church and the word that God put on their heart. Uh, and that's one of the things we believe in here at Vima is we want to see Vima help people take their next step in their faith journey. And for some people, that means growing in their ministry gifts. And so it's, a, it's always an honor to get to do that. But today I'm bringing a word uh, to you. And, and I, I really kind of struggle with the, the, what to preach today. You can ask my wife. I, I was like, I don't, I don't really want to do like a Father's Day message or a Mother's Day message a couple weeks ago. I just like to preach the word. And sometimes I feel like kind of slow down to, to do specific things like that. And I struggled with it. I was like, well, maybe I could just preach to the men, or maybe we just talk about um, things like our words mattering and things like that. And I really kind of felt like that was resonating in my heart, like our words matter. But I couldn't get away from the idea of, uh, of talking to fathers and talking about fathers and dads say, because one, I think our society desperately needs some strong male leadership. Uh, we need it in the church. We need it in our homes. We need it in our government. We need it in our school systems. We need it on our sports teams. We need it in the insurance offices and at the banks and at the car lots. Like we need some strong male Bible-believing, uh, you know, people who are filled with the Spirit of God, living life and taking care of the people around them. So I, I wanted to speak to that, but also at the same time, I didn't want to leave all the ladies out in the room. And I was like, you know, so God, what do we do with this? And so I just started thinking about the words of a father. And today, that's what I'm going to talk to you about, the words of a father. But um, in that, I, I immediately started thinking about the, the dadisms of, of life. And I'm 41 years old now, and so I use a lot more dadisms than I used to use a couple years ago. I am fully embraced them. Um, in fact, I buy most of my clothes at the same place I buy my groceries. And so I'm in full dad mode now. Uh, I wear socks with slides, um, you know, things like that. Um, and so I say things to my kids when they're mowing the grass, like, do you put, do you put some sunglasses on? Um, you know, I was at the, uh, at the uh, not here at the church, I was at my dad's house the other day, and we strapped down some stuff in the back of a trailer. And after I got the ratchet straps tight, you know what I said? That's not going anywhere, because that's what dads say, right? That's what you say when you strap something down. When you go to the grill and you're flipping the burgers, you got to click the clickers three times, right? That's like a rite of passage, just things that dads do. Uh, you know, when your kids come up and ask you for money, which I've got some teenage sons, it happens a lot more now than it used to. You know, I found myself the other day saying, do you think I'm made of money, right? There's things that dads say. Uh, I said this the other day, our trampoline, we, we got a newer trampoline and it's just like a piece of junk. It's, I've had to put the thing back together like three times. And I said out loud to my family, they just don't make them like they used to, right? There's things that dads say that we all know. Uh, yesterday, my daughter came up to me. She was like, hey, can I go next door and play with my friend? And what did I say? Go ask your Mom, <laughs> dads have lines, and we use them all the time. Uh, my, Jonah, my second son, he came up to me, and he said, hey, Dad, we're driving home from Arkansas. He spent some time with some family. He said, hey, Dad, I'm hungry. I said, hey, I'm Dad. Nice to meet you, right? <laughs> like, these are things I'm finding that I'm using on a regular basis. Any dads in a room, like, you just, you just, you love to do it. You love to just, like, almost when my kids notice it, and you're irritated by it, it inspires me to do it more. <laughs> Something inside of me goes, let's just, is there some more of these I can learn? Is there some more of these I can embrace? And, you know, being a dad is one of the greatest joys of my life. But honestly, it's also one of the hardest things that I do 
And here's what I'm realizing now, maybe more than ever, and it's a truth I believe that, uh, that affects all of us, no matter what your relationship was like with your father here um, on earth, this, there's a truth that brings us all together today, and it's this, is that the words of a father have a great impact on every one of us. So it doesn't matter where you're at, doesn't matter who your dad was or is, what kind of context or relationship you've had with them, the reality is this, and this truth holds us all together the words of a father have a great impact on us. And this goes on the good side, and this can go to the bad side. It swings both ways. And since I know that in a room like this, we all come from different places and different positions and different experiences, both healthy and, and hurtful. Like I said, I debated not even really speaking on the idea of fatherhood, but I weighed this, I prayed through this, and I realized this person in position in our lives, father, it is maybe one of the most important positions in our lives as, as far as our culture and our society, and it's something that needs to be talked about. Today, I want to share with you uh, some words of a father, and I'm going to share with you seven things I believe that every dad should share with their kids. And if you're a dad in a room, write these down because I think these are things you need to say to your kids. Um, if you're an adult in a room and and maybe you're not a dad or maybe you're not in the position of having kids, I think you should write these down because maybe these are things that were missed in your own life, things that maybe apply to you even as an adult. Um, if you're a kid in a room and maybe your, your dad's not here and that, not part of your life, maybe take notes. This could be healing and fulfilling to you and your future and potential because this is what I believe. I believe the words of a father have a great impact. And if you'll allow me to, I want to stand in proxy of your dad today and I want to share some things I think every Christian dad should say. And so no matter what your relationship is, I know we're all coming at this from a different position, different perspective, but if you'll allow me to, I want to, I want to stand in proxy and from the depths of my heart and the depths of my soul, I, I want to share some things that I believe Christian fathers should be sharing with their kids. And, and even as adults, I think these things will be powerful if you'll open yourself up to it, because I think this, it's not too late to learn, it's not too late to hear and to believe, and it's not too late to hold on to these truths that I believe dads should be sharing with their kids. So here's the first one for you today. First thing, and these are gonna be very simple, but I'm gonna share them with you. One is that God loves you so, so much. First John 3, 1 says this, see how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. See, John, that was like a very simple point. I could have predicted that one. I didn't even need you to fill in the blank for me to fill in the blank on that one. That may be true, but I, I, I'm almost positive some people in the room that don't necessarily believe this, that they don't necessarily believe that God actually loves you because maybe your earthly father didn't show you the love of a father. And when we talk about God the father, maybe there's a disconnect there. Maybe there's a, a desire or earning. Maybe your, your father, your dad was put a lot of pressure on you to live up to a certain standard. And there's a desire and a, earn, a yearning for you to like try to do better and try to do more and try to accomplish more. And you always are seeking love and not realizing that God already loves you how you are. Like he's not waiting for you to accomplish something. He's not waiting for you to achieve something. Here's the reality. Right now, no matter where you are in your walk with God or with your walk with your family or your, your journey in life or your job, this is a truth that you need to hear. God loves you. Right now, how you are. And he loves you so, so much. He's greater. He's more perfect. He's a better father than what you've ever known. And I'll do my best as a dad to walk in this love and this image, but make no mistakes. I can tell you this if my kids, are, they'll be in second service, but make no mistakes. Like God's love is better than mine. And you need to have, I believe every father should be teaching their kids, like I'm going to do the best I can to love you the best I can. And I can promise you this, I won't love you as good today as I will tomorrow because I'm a work in progress. But I can also promise you this, God's love is complete. It is not a work in progress. He loves you completely and wholly. It's unconditional. It's never ending. It was there before you loved him, and it was there way after you started loving him. God loves you so much. I think every kid needs to hear this. When you fall, he loves you. When you fail, he loves you. When you walk away, he loves you. When you come back, he loves you. When you chase after him and seek to know him better, God loves you. When you do in life, what you do in life that does not determine his love for you, his love is finite. It is there, it is established. Romans 8, 38. 
For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how much your God loves you. A second thought for us today. And this is, I, I apologize, I'm going right into the uh, deep end and going to tug on maybe some of your hearts. But second thing I think every father needs to tell their kids from time to time is this, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I know this as a dad, that I am a flawed dad. I'm a flawed husband. I'm a flawed human being. I've made lots of mistakes and I continue to make mistakes. And I think there's something that every father should be able to say, should be willing to say to his kids, and this is this, is I am sorry. Probably we should say this more, if I'm being honest. I uh, most definitely miss some opportunities to say this in my life. Or maybe I did something or I said something I wish I wouldn't have said or said it in a manner at which I wouldn't have said it. And, and, and sometimes I find myself losing my cool and, and maybe raising my voice a little bit louder than what I would like to. And, and I find myself sometimes just backing out of those moments and resetting when maybe the thing I should do is pause and just say, I'm sorry. And, and, and there's so many things that I, I could do better. Some might say they did the best they could or the best they knew how to. Um, that I've heard that said before. In fact, I've said that to my kids before. I'm doing the best I know how to do, man. You're going to have to, you, this is going to have to be good enough for you today because this is as good as a dad as I am today. Uh, this is the best I know how to do. Uh, others might not have done anything. They, they might not have done the best they could do. They might have fallen short or might have not even been there. Regardless, I'm here to see you today to tell you, stand in proxy for your father and say, I'm sorry. I know that dads are supposed to be heroes I know that we're supposed to protect you. I know that we're supposed to teach you. And I know sometimes I miss that. And, and I'm standing in proxy for some of you today. And maybe some of the dads in the room, you're going to go, yep, that's me. I, I maybe need to say I'm sorry. Some, maybe some moms in the room, like I can recognize I'm not the dad. But, I, man, there's some opportunities and moments I need to say I'm sorry. But maybe you don't have those relationships with you. And I, that's why I'm standing in proxy. I want to say I'm sorry. I remember... The first time I had to apologize to my son, I don't know if, if you're a dad in the room, if you remember this, but I remember the first time I had to apologize to my son. He, 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 I don't remember what he did, but he did something, and he elevated his voice, like in, in talking back, and I elevated my voice, and then all of a sudden, all, we found ourselves kind of going back and forth, kind of tit for tat, like who's going to take the upper hand, who's the man of the house, right? And, and well, I'm the man of the house. I pay for the house. <laughs> The clothes you're wearing are mine. The shoes you're standing in are mine. The carpet you're standing on is mine. The dirt that's under the carpet, that's also mine. This is my house. <laughs> but there's not a lot of sense you can talk with a, a 12-year-old, 13-year-old. And I, I remember, like, I got the upper hand, and we had a conversation, and I got him back down to his level. And I walked out, and I didn't feel better about it. I didn't feel like me checking him and his place in the house made me a better dad in that moment. And so I had to figure out, what am I going to do? Like, I don't want to apologize for him being a turd, you know? <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, son, because, you know, but I also don't want to do the backwards apology. Like, I'm sorry you brought this out of me, <laughs> you know, because then that's basically blaming everything on them. And the reality is I'm a, I'm a man of my own words. I'm a man of my own positions, my own, my own attitudes and my own tones. And, and so I remember having, sitting down having that conversation for the very first time. I walked in, sat down, said, hey, I need to talk to you. And he immediately, because he knows what to do, hey, Dad, I'm sorry. I was like, Before, take yours back. I don't want yours yet. <laughs> I, need, I need to put mine out there first. And so I, had, I remember the first time having to say that. Those are not easy words to say. It's not easy to come and acknowledge our own fault and our own situations, especially when we know our own fault. You think by knowing that you're full of sin and failure and fault, that would make it easier to acknowledge it in front of others. But I think it's the opposite sometimes. It's like I already know I messed up. The last thing I want to do is go talk about it. And, and, and I think this is what's important for dads to be man enough to say, I'm sorry. In fact, I think that may, this may be one of the strongest positions. This may show the most strength a man can show with his attitudes and his tones is by seeking forgiveness and admitting his own fault. And, and so I'll show you this, Mark eleven twenty five. And wherever you stand praying, whenever you stand praying, excuse me, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. 
There's a reason that we need to seek forgiveness as, as, as fathers and, and mothers and as people in general. Uh, the reason is we need to say things like, will you forgive me? I am sorry. The reason is, and Jesus states it very clearly here, is that our forgiveness is attached to his forgiveness. And if we don't model forgiveness in our relationships and in our homes and with the people that we love the most, how will we process forgiveness with our Heavenly Father? Like, how can I understand it? How can I grasp it? How can I receive it? How can I seek it from Him when it's something I'm unwilling to even recognize here with the people I love the most? And so I think saying I'm sorry is something that we just have to grow to do. And please don't hold on to bitterness or hate. It's not worth it. I don't, I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going, what you've gone through, what, what you're carrying with you. But I promise you, when you hold on, I talked about forgiveness a few months ago in a series called Red Flags. But when you hold on to unforgiveness, it's like drinking the poison and hope it hurts someone else. That's what unforgiveness does. And so when you forgive, when you say, I'm sorry, what you're doing is you're not letting them go. You're letting yourself go. And this is why we need to be people. We don't need to allow our families, or our kids, or our spouses to, to hold grudges because we've not acknowledged our own faults. So let's be people who say, I'm sorry. Third thing I think every father should teach and say to his kids is that this is God's word is helpful. It, it, it's, it is helpful. It, it's not just this book that we open up on Sundays because we're religious. It's not this duty that we're trying to fulfill because God did something for us, so therefore I'm gonna open this and read this to him. It's not an exchange of goods. Jesus gave his life, so I'll read the Bible. It's not that. It, God's word is wisdom, it's, it's discernment, it's understanding, it's helpful. In Matthew 4, 4, this is what Jesus said about the word of God. He says, but he answered, it is written, he says, it is written, meaning he's quoting the word of God. He's talking about the word of God. He says, man shall not live on bread alone, but my every word that comes from the mouth of God. The, the word of God is life. It is helpful. It's discernment. It's encouragement. It's wisdom. There are many things that I want and need to teach to my kids, but there are some things that they have to know. There's a lot of things, let me say this again, there's, there's a lot of things I, I feel the desire or, or uh, need to teach them. Like I want to teach them this, I need to teach them this, but I'm telling you this, there's a few things they have to know. And this is what they have to know. They have to know that God's word is helpful to them. That is a place of encouragement, is a place of wisdom, is a place of direction for their lives. They need to know it and this is how they're gonna know it. It's not by me saying it, but by, by me seeking it. When I'm looking for answers in my own life, when I'm struggling through things in my own life, my kids need to see me turn to the Word of God. And you may be in a room, again, you may be, I don't have kids. Your spouse needs to see you get in the Word of God. Maybe you're not married. Your friends need to see you get in the Word of God because we have relationships in our lives that the things that we do are reflection and they help our showing. People, the first Jesus many people will ever get to know is the one that lives in you before they get to know the one that lives in the word by, on their own. They're gonna judge it by seeing you in your life. So we need to be people who get in the word. In fact, I would say this, the more that you know God's word, the more that you know God. And so if we want our kids to know God, we need to know, they need to know God's word. And we don't just need to start with Google or start with TikTok or start with uh, Snapchat or whatever is out there, Instagram. We don't need to start with just listening to other voices, podcasts, books, we need to teach our kids to start in the Word of God. Before I go and Google, what does someone else think about this? I need to go, God, what do you think about this? And if I believe the God of the universe is here and he's alive and he's speaking and he's speaking to me, I know one of the most profound ways that he speaks is through his written word. In fact, some of you are listening and you're looking and you're asking God, God, would you speak to me? And he's already spoken and it's been written for 2,000 years and we've been holding on to it. And you're looking and you're asking God, I want to hear you, I want to know you. And you're holding the very thing he's trying to speak to you through. Just open it up. He's got a word for you. It's already written. Open it up. We got to teach this to our kids and those around us. Start with God's word. God's word's helpful. Next thing is this. I want to teach my kids. The church is not perfect, but it is beautiful. And it's, in fact, it's in its brokenness. It's in its flaws. I think that we find the beauty of the church. I, I, a couple of years ago, I was in Louisville, Kentucky, and there's a friend of mine that has a church there. And 
um, he, he, he uh, transitioned to church, and he's just a little bit older than me, and, and the church is a beautiful church. It's got these big, giant windows on the left and right. It's kind of a long, old-school, kind of Baptist, long shotgun-style church, and these big, giant glass pieces, and, or big, big glass windows, and they put these shades on them, and you could see the shades from the outside, just kind of, kind of tacky. And it didn't block all the light, it only blocked some of the light. And so one of the things that he did when he first got there, he had a guy in a church that would make these things that the church would do, these potlucks, kind of this old school church, and they would sell things for missions, and he would make these little stained glasses. They're about this big, and he would sell them of just different things, different pictures. And so he, he proposed to the guy, said, hey, let's take out these windows and let's build stained glass for these and so the guy was like, man, I, I do this in my living room <laughs> uh, on the side to make some money to give the missions. Like, that's not the same thing as filling up these 10 giant windows with stained glasses. Like, I think we can do it. Let's, so they pulled in a couple construction guys. There was a guy in the church that was a glass guy, and he told them how they're going to have to do it. And so I got to see the process, and they had the drawings all done. They had this big garage out, and I got to see, I walked in while he was working on it. And he had these big pieces of glass that they brought in. And this is what he was doing. He was breaking the glass. Big, beautiful pieces, pieces of solid color of glass. And he's got a little hammer and a chisel. And he's just making it in the little pieces. Some people would say, well, that was something perfectly good that you broke it. And that, but when you saw the finished product, you realized that through the brokenness, the beauty was going to come. You could take a solid piece of blue glass. That's not pretty. It's just blue. Everyone's going to look like a smurf in the church, right? The sun starts coming in. It makes the whole room blue. Like, that's not pretty. What makes it pretty is the process of brokenness, the process of the flaws, the process of what about this here and what about this? How do these things come together to make something beautiful? And I watched as he put this, he had, they had one done, and they had it kind of standing up off to the side. It was about 20 foot tall, and it was beautiful. But the beauty was in the, the brokenness and the flaws. And, and I think this is something that we need to teach to our kids is that the church is not a place full of perfect people. The pastor's not perfect. Your small group's not perfect. Your youth pastor, the kids pastor, the small group people, they're like, these people are not perfect. And if your kids grow up with a sense thinking that the church is this perfect thing, then when they see the brokenness of it, they think it's just broken. They, they just go, well, that's not as good as it should be, or that's not good as it could be. But when they know that the church is broken, people, when they know that you're part of that, that thing, then as they grow up, I think the flaws turn into beauty. They start to see like you go through things and people go through it with you. They start to see that, that, you're gonna, that, that, that you need the friendships that are found in a church and that someday maybe they will too. They'll start to see that, that you need the teachings that are found in a church and that someday they're going to need those too. They're going to see that you needed the discipleship that you found and the growth that you found and that they need that too. You're going to see that you, that you needed the opportunities to, be, that, to, to walk in your purpose and giftings and, and to be found in a church and they're going to need those too. They're going to see that you, you, needed the experiencing the, and you need the experience of the presence of God, that there's moments that you came to church and it wasn't just like any other Sunday, but when you came Came, the presence of God moved in a powerful way, and they saw that God touched you that day, and they're going to need to know that they can walk into a place like this when they need a touch from God, and that God will meet them there. That he's faithful, and he's just to do that. They're, they're going to need to know that, that there's joy and sorrow found here. It's not just a place of all fun all the time. We got snow cones today. We got putt-putt today, but there may be some days you walk in, and there's a brokenness or a heaviness to it, and they're going to need to know that this is a place you can experience all of life with these people. And, and we need to make sure that, that, that we show our kids the church is not perfect, but it is beautiful. Ephesians chapter 2, I love what Paul has to say. He says, see this, that no longer you're strangers or aliens, but you're now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So you once were on the outside, now you're part of this family. It says, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Here's why your kids need to find church and see the beauty in church, even in its flaws, is because the cornerstone itself is Jesus Christ. Like if you want your kids to experience the fullness of Jesus, the church is part of that. And we need to make sure our kids are having these opportunities and these exp experiences. The church will disappoint you and hurt you, but don't give up on her. Christ didn't give up on us. 
It was the last thing on earth that Christ established. He put it in motion with his ascension, and it's the thing that's still happening today. In fact, this is the longest running thing in our Christian faith. Uh, the, 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 the tabernacle and the sacrifices, the, the Old Testament, and then the, the church as we see it today are the two longest standing formations of, of spiritual development that God has given us. The tabernacle and the church. And so if you love the Old Testament and you love the tabernacle, you ought to love the church too. Because these two things run hand in hand, fist in fist. It's how God is moving through his people. Next thing, number five. Oh, there's the rest of the scripture. We'll move on. Number five. Life is hard. Something every dad, every father should teach his kids. Lean into the weight and get stronger. Life is hard. You know, one of the, one of the Ryan's saying, come on, because we're working out together. He's like, you just think life is hard. Wait till Monday, John. <laughs> we're going to get under the weight. Um, you know, as a father, I think one of the things, and as mothers, grandparents, you probably experience this too, friends, spouses. I wish I could take away the hard parts. I, I, I wish that my kids just got to have fun. I wish it was just, I wish the summer was just snow cones and swimming and watching movies and hanging out. I wish they didn't have to do the dishes every other day. I mean, that's just the worst, isn't it? Any, any kids in the room? I wish they didn't have to take out the trash. I wish they didn't have to study for tests. You know, like I, I'm being facetious towards my kids right now because the summer is the worst. But there's things that are in life that are hard. There's things that in life that are difficult. Um, just this last week, uh, one of my best friends, his, his father went to be with Jesus he was a great man, and I, I got to be there with him just a little bit this week back in Arkansas. And, and, and the conversations we had, one of the conversations we had was just that the toughest part about this was him having to have the conversation with his kids, telling his kids that grandpa's not here anymore. Like, life's hard. I wish it wasn't. I, I wish things were easy. I wish things were good. And maybe for some of us, life is harder than maybe some of the rest of us. We could take our lives and go A and B, and you could say, man, look what this person went through versus what this person went through. But I'll tell you this, I've sat with enough people, I've counseled with enough people, that pain is relative. And the reality is, it doesn't matter what you've been through, we've all been through something. It doesn't matter what you've lost, I could tell you this, everyone in the room has lost something. It doesn't matter what, what's come against you, everyone in the room. Yes, there's different variances of that, but I can tell you this, we're all broken people, and a lot, a lot of us have had hard things happen to us. Uh, Romans. Chapter 5 says this, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Uh, and this is something we have to model for our kids. You can't teach this to your kids. You can't tell your kids, hey, this is horrible, but you should enjoy it. Like, that doesn't make sense. That, that, right, this is part of the Christian faith that doesn't, it doesn't belong on one of those motivational posters hanging up in an office, right? You don't want to see this with an eagle soaring that says, rejoice in your sufferings. You know, that's not like, that's not an image of Christian faith. You're not going to find us at Mardell's hanging on a poster or on a coffee mug or on a t-shirt because this is part of the Christian faith that's difficult. It's not easy to explain. It's something that must be modeled out. Something I would say it's got to be caught more than it's got to be taught. Like your kids got to see you maintain and hold on to joy and peace and patience, even in hardship. They got to see this inside of us, rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope that does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So sufferings, this idea, it brings us to hope. Uh, that's the journey that we're on. And our kids need to see us. We need to be people who embrace and walk through seasons and find them and, and get stronger in them. I've given this example before, I think a few months ago, about getting under the weight. You don't get stronger if you lift the same weight over and over and over again. We gotta be people who wanna get under the weight, who recognize that things get hard. When things get hard, we keep going. When things get hard, we keep trusting Jesus. When things get hard, we keep opening up his word. When things get hard, we keep praying and lifting our voices and our prayers and our songs to God. That our faith doesn't get pushed to the side so we can deal with the hard stuff. But while we're dealing with the hard stuff, our faith rises to the top. That it's the thing that our kids see in the hardest, most difficult portions of our life. And I think as a parent, as a father, it's one of the things we got to teach our kids. That life's hard. But... We can move forward and that we can grow in this. The sixth one, I'm almost to the end, just these last two here. I think the sixth one for me that I think every father, if I, if I could stand in proxy again, 
is that people deserve your kindness. People deserve your kindness. The world's a hard place. People have gone through more than what you can imagine. Don't forget this when you're bumping into people from time to time. Typically, as, as, as a pastor, I've been able to experience this, and you probably have too, as friends and people who are in relationships and have families. Typically, people's responses are directly related to their pain. And so when someone is angry or someone is frustrated or someone is bitter or someone's evil even, has, a, has an angle to them or someone ha- has hurtful things that they say or someone is overly sarcastic, things like this that, that maybe hurt us, and I'm not talking about sarcasm as a sense of dad fun, dadisms. There's a certain amount of that that's, that's all right. Um, but I'm talking about the stuff that cuts you and leaves you walking away wounded. Those things, those type of responses are typically coming from pain. And, and so we've got to realize that people in our lives, that they deserve our kindness. You never know what people are carrying. You never know what they're going through. But this is what we do know is that Jesus in us, in any situation, can bring hope. Jesus through us in any situation can bring love. And in fact, one of the things that Jesus told his disciples, this is how people will know that you're one of my disciples, by how you love each other. But not by how you get even, not by how you settle the score, not how you always win or how you make the most money or how your business always flourishes more than anyone else's. The way that you're gonna be known as a disciple of Christ is by the love that comes out of you and it touches other people. And so I think, man, for one of the things I feel like I'm very passionate, I want to teach my kids is that people deserve your kindness. They don't deserve your judgment. They don't deserve your criticism. They've got enough of that in your life. Let's be people who are kind. And here's the last one for us. Whatever I have is yours. As a father, this is one of the things that that I, I, I believe to be true about myself and probably many of you in the room is that Everything I have, whatever I have, is yours. I want to give you everything. I want to give you everything that you need, everything that you want. But sometimes the sad reality is I'm not able to. As a parent, you know, mothers, kids, wouldn't matter. Like maybe you're married again. You can take this to different relational aspects. But I think the reality is when we have people we love, we want to give them what they need. We want to give them what they want. And sometimes we find ourselves not able to do that. But one thing is for certain, even if I can't give you everything that you want and everything that you need, one thing is true. Everything that I do have is yours. You may need more, but I'm telling you, what I've got, you can have. If there's something that you need, it's yours. There may be something else that you have or someone else that you need or some other piece of puzzle, but I'm telling you, 100% of what I have is yours. And this reminded me of a story of a of a father and a son in the Bible. It's in Luke chapter 15, where a son went to his father and he asked for his inheritance. He said, hey, dad, um, there's two sons and each son gets an inheritance. And he says, dad, can I have my portion? Which that in itself is a, is a huge faux pas because it's, a, it's, a, um, it's almost as if you're saying to the dad, I wish you were dead because the inheritance comes to you after the passing of your father. So when you look your father in the eye and you say, I want what's mine, what you're saying is, I don't even want you, I just want what you have. And so the father agrees, says, I'll give it to you. He gives it to the son. Son takes it, lives in the world for the world, squanders it, parties, has fun, all kinds of crazy stuff. Finds himself sometime later with nothing. All the friends he had that he gathered when he had stuff, when he had money, when he had influence, they're all gone when he didn't have anything left. And he finds himself, he's, he's living in some farmer's quarters and he's literally, he's working the pigs and he, he doesn't have any money to eat or to pay for the food. So he's literally taking the food from the pigs and he's surviving off of that. And he has a realization. And he realizes, my dad's servants eat better than me. My dad's servants are living better than me. If anything, if I can get my dad to take me back as just a servant, my life will move forward because that's how far he had gone down. So he rehearses a speech and he, he's on his way back to his father. And I'm just going to show you just the, the story of what happens as he's approaching his father. He's got his speech rehearsed. He's ready to tell his dad, dad, I'm sorry, dad, I blew it. Dad, just let me be a servant. I, I know my sonship is ruined. I spat in your face. I took what you, what you gave me and I squandered it. And he, he's approaching his dad and this is what happens. Verse 20, it says, as he rose to come to see his father, 
It says, but while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. It's going to barbecue. Good, good, good scripture for Father's Day. Let's have some steaks and some ribs. Come on now. Um, you didn't, we were wondering, is barbecuing in the Bible? Multiple places. I'll show you other places after service. So he says, hey. Um, he says, bring the fattened calf. We're going to barbecue. We're going to eat. We're going to celebrate. For this, my son was dead, and now he is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. And this is what it says. They began to celebrate. They began to celebrate. But the, the part of the story that I love is it says this, but while he was still a long way off, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion. You see, the son, he took everything that the father had to give wasted it, squandered it. And you're thinking, yeah, that's what dads do. They give everything they can. They, they give, that's what they should do. Give all that they have. But what happens when your kids blow it all and they make mistakes and they ruin their lives and they ruin your name and they ruin their reputation and they waste years of their life? What do you do when that happens? What do you, what's the response of a father when your kid takes it all and is thankless and is, is ungrateful and waste it you see, the father may not have much to give, but what he was willing to do was to give it all again. He says that the father restored his inheritance. The father didn't even let him finish his speech. He had a whole speech. If you go back, you can look at it. That he only got about half the speech out. And the father, did, he says, I'm unworthy to be your son. And this is the father's response. He doesn't say, yeah, I've been needing to talk to you about that. What you did to me and your mom and our family. No, that's not their father. The father's response wasn't, well, you're right. Actually, for six months, I'm going to let you work this off. And have, no, what the father did, so his immediate response was get the calf. Let's throw a party. And like, what's the, what's the reason for this? Why, why is this the case? And, and this is so unlike, and this is why I, I think this is such a pivotal point for us today, because this is so unlike me. I, I'm, I'm a graceful person. I love my kids and I would give them anything. But I think sometimes our love has endpoints to it. Our, our frustration levels hit us. And, and maybe for you in the room, maybe you've been the son. And maybe for you in the room, you've been the father. And, and you recognize maybe you've been given some opportunities and you've gone the wrong direction. You've spent time going and chasing the wrong things. Or maybe you've been the father and, and you've given some opportunities. But maybe they're, you're at this moment now, like, I'm not sure I could take them back. But this is what I love about the father is that the father may not have much to give, but in the end, it wasn't about the money. He says, I'll, I'll give you the inheritance. But what's, what's the end of the story? The end of the story is he throws a party. In the end, the party was not about the money and restoring the money and whether the, the business did well or it didn't do well, whether there was something to give or something not to give. In the end, what it came down to was a lost son became found. A son that was dead now is believed to be alive. And this is the heart of a father is that I don't just want you to have stuff. I'll give you everything that I have. Everything I have, it may not be enough, but I'll give it all. But the heart of a father is not that you would have all that you want or that, that you would need. The heart of a father is that you would know Jesus and that you would not be lost, but you would be found. And I'll give everything that I can. I'll tell you this. I'll give everything that I can so my kids can have that experience. Everything that I can do, everything that I can give, there's nothing that I can have that is worth anything as much as it is as my kids going from lost to found. And the same heart that I have for my kids, I believe the Heavenly Father has for you today. You, some of you in the room maybe feel like you're unworthy, like the son said. He goes, I, I'm unworthy. I've messed up my life. I've gone some different directions. I didn't have a father do or say the things that you're talking about today. I went some places and I've done some things and I'm not where I hoped I would be. And if God would just take me back as a servant, that would be fine. If I could just squeak into heaven, I would be fine with that. I just don't want to live the life I've lived. I don't want to go to hell. If I could just squeak in, and this is what's so good about the, our God, our Father. He says, you're no one squeaking into heaven. If you're lost and you become found, there's a party. It doesn't matter if it's one or if it's a thousand or if it's 10,000. A lost is found, we throw a party. And this is what Jesus told us. He says, when one is saved, all of heaven erupts. And here in this story, he says, when one lost son becomes saved. And 
And today, I, you may think this is just another Father's Day, and I, I want to just respectfully say you're wrong. Because I think some of you today, for the first time ever, maybe heard some positive things from a father. And I'm standing in proxy. I'm not your dad. I, I've got four. I can't take any more. <laughs> but from the heart of God, these are things that he wants for you. Uh, these are things that should have been said to you. And I don't think it's too late to hold on to these things. And I don't think it's too late to know Jesus. Let me pray for you today.